it seems that we're all back from lunch and we can start the next session. And it's uh, an exciting one on inelastic samples and maximums. So a large category of instruments are working with this in some way. Uh, and we will talk about how to simulate this in that space. First, uh, a quick overview of the storm. It will be a, a short introduction to what is inelastic scattering and how does it connect with neutron scattering theory. Then I'll talk about two of the inelastic sample components that we do have in the package, but there are actually not many more that I in use. After that, we need to discuss some of the issues there are or difficulties to overcome in using uh, these inelastic samples because some of them use a data-driven approach. <coughs> then there are also some issues in, the, in performance with the <coughs> spectroscopy class of instruments that I want to discuss. And of course, then at the end, it's time for some exercises. So first of all, inelastic scattering is connected to the partial differential cross-section of the neutron <coughs> through this S, Q, and omega. So it's sometimes called the scattering function and has some, some value for every Q vector and energy transfer omega. And of course, that's a four-dimensional space and it's also densely populated in the way that, for example, a Bragg peak could be in this one and it's a very narrow area of Q and a very narrow area of energy transfer. And yet the room that we investigate can be very large. There is a complex way to calculate this scattering function from fundamental operators of the system. So this in principle has nothing directly to do with neutron scattering. All of that is in this part of the equation. And so it's a natural point of handing over information from the uh, theoretical physicist working just on the solid state physics, and then we can plug it into this equation and get our scattering cross sections. One of the components that, that does this analytically in MACFAS is called phonon simple. And it just simulates a single isotropic acoustic phonon branch. It does so in all brilliant zones of an FCC crystal and a Bravais lattice. The Bravais lattice means that it's just a single atom in each unit cell. So a lot of simplifying requirements. But if all of that is fulfilled, it will, it will make this branch analytically and very fast. And here are the equation for the differential cross-section for such a phonon. It will do both the uh, you can see by this term they'll do both creation and annihilation of a phonon. And for an FCC lattice, this is an um, acoustic phonon in an FCC lattice. This is the relevant dispersion. And here I just put up some of the meanings of the quantities in this formula, as maybe we don't use exactly the same names. But Visually, it's much easier to communicate and it's some quadratic dispersion with, uh, in of course, three-dimensional view around the break point and in the energy. And here I used uh, monitor MD to show you the scalar wave vector around such a break point where we see the dispersion. The, the color is because of the source I use uh, and the orientation of the crystal, so it's, it's more likely to scatter here, but this is the range that we can scatter. And there's nothing outside this, because it can only scatter at a single time, so very simple. We can look in, um, in energy slices in Q space and see that we get some uh, well, I guess there are spheres becoming larger and larger with higher energy transfer. And here I focus on, on this one, that's what I set the crystal for. But others are um, 
excited and do scatter uh, in this example. Now the next component I wish to discuss is called isotropic SQ omega. And it's a, a very general component that does its multiple scattering and uh, it can do the concentric you see here where it has uh, some sample environment around the crystal and it takes a data file. It takes the SQ omega data file directly in some format, binned in some way. But the Q is not a vector, it's a scalar. So it's hence isotropic. So this is useful for powders and liquids uh, and things like that. It supports both coherent and incoherent contributions that can be set separately. And it works in a, in a quite uh, distinct way. Uh, it, it does something important sampling on the, uh, the distribution and it also does some important pre-calculations in order to be reasonably fast. So first it calculates a, a probability distribution of the energy transfer. In this system here, this is the SQ omega, it's a, a helium uh, phonon of some sort, or roton I think it is. It's more likely to have energy transfers in this range than this range. So it will more often select these up here. And of course that's renormalized in such a way that it should still produce the correct result. Then when an energy transfer is selected, it will integrate over a small range and then we have a probability of a certain momentum transfer given our already selected energy transfer. And then we pick uh, the scattering vector from this distribution. There's the slight problem that sometimes there's no solution for a given neutron and then it will simply try again. And it will do that up to a hundred times I think. So sometimes if you use a a beam with insufficient energy to reach the excitations, for example, then it will continue to try until it maybe finds a lucky one neutron that's just on the edge of your beam and can do it, but most often it will fail and then it will take an extremely long time to run the component. So if you feel you, you are it's running forever and not giving you any results, maybe you cannot really reach the dispersion of the beam you're using. Okay, but enough about how it works. Let's look a little at the, some of the results it can produce. Here we see energy transfer and momentum. So of course we see the scattering intensity. And this is rubidium liquid, I believe. And there's some weak dispersions just in this area. It's hard to see and some here too. But at least we get a lot of broad scattering out in uh, with, with some energy transfer and there's also a few black and light points because there are, there are certain characteristic distances in this liquid that correspond to certain distances and they you can see these it's a little easier if you download the talk uh, but so it, it's a quite comprehensive description of a power now why, why don't we just use that for, uh, for all power scattering in max that seems very nice. Well, there are some issues with, with the sampling of uh, the data file. Of course, it's okay to do for power, but still, you have some error in the, in the box size of your bin data. And so, often it looks a little different if you use uh, this isotropic SQ omega and the power in component because the, um, the bins might corrupt it a little bit. And if we then wanted to use the same approach for a single crystal, we would have to add another two dimensions of space and then we get these volumes in three dimensions and of course we need to remember an energy dimension as well. 
And we want to have fine enough resolution that we can see the back points, but also enough area that it covers our time of life spectrometer or so. And that results in some incredibly large data files and incredibly slow runtimes because then every we have to test all of these for every neutron and we have to scatter in all of these at some point in order to get results from them and that just results in slow computations. So we have to do some tricks in order to do this well and we haven't quite gotten that yet. Another small issue we have with inelastic scattering is that the instrumentation is actually really inefficient. So in our powder diffectometer we can just normally set the wavelength at our source to the reasonable interval and then we only stimulate neutrons that sort of have a chance of at least going to the detector. But in a triple axis instrument, you should probably simulate a, a wider range because the monochromator has more orders and you probably remove some of the filter. And then your single little wavelength goes to the sample. And that's only maybe 1% of what you simulate. Then that sample produces some different dispersions and then we select just a little bit of, of that uh, with our analyzer. So that maybe we're down to 1% again and then it's 1% of 1%. And it's just a tiny amount of neutrons that actually reach our detector. Oh well, then we can just go to a charm spectrometer. But no, we have kind of the same issues but just in the time domain instead, where you're very likely to hit this blockage in the monochromatic chopper before the sample. So on many spectroscopy instruments, you just throw away a lot of neutrons when you do this sort of analysis, when you need to know both the initial and the final wavelength. And this also is a factor in the longer run times when you measure inelastic. So it's definitely a concept that's supported the max class, but we could probably use some more work on more sample components, also faster sample components. And as I mentioned, longer computational times, but the upside is that many of these simulation approaches are actually most valuable in spectroscopy because they have the most advanced weird when looking resolution functions because they are four dimensional. So it's very, very much worthwhile to, to do this hard exercise, do the computational time in order to get these very beneficial data. And now it's time for you to try to do some inelastic experiments and methods. The, the first one is a triple axis spectrometer and it is using these union components so I have made a zip folder on the github where you can get all the components you need it's using a slightly newer version than the one that's in the uh, 2.5 uh, version of Maxfest because it includes the photon symbol with the single crystal so you get a uh, a tri uh, triple axis instrument that can cope with phonons and the single crystal at once. Okay, good luck!